Amen. Amen. I certainly appreciate what's gone before. And uh, I know that it's 12.07 by my clock. I'm going to be mindful of time just like these brothers before have been. Um, I'm from Alabama, so we're in central time, right? So uh, my, my clock, my internal clock says 11.07. Uh, so I'll be done by lunch uh, in Alabama time. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I can smell lunch back there, so I'm, I'm ready to, to, to be done too. Um, I will be, um, I'll be mindful of the time. Um, if you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis, um, chapter 2, I want to talk to you about something uh, briefly this morning. I want to talk to you about uh, meology, right, versus theology, okay? Um, uh, Brother Drew uh, was talking last night at supper um, about um, you know, a lot of churches here in the area, uh, and a lot of very big churches, you know, and we see that. We see that in, in um, American Christianity. We see that well, it's, it's not just an American thing. It's a it's been there since we'll see in Genesis. But this uh, fixation on the things that we can get out of it. Okay, we're here today to worship God, and yes, I hope we get fed. Okay, I hope that I get fed today, and I already have been. But ultimately, we're not here for me, right? <laughs> we're here for Him, right? You know, um, churches, uh, the, the American Christianity today is about the performance that you get out of it, right? Just like all these other, you know, entertainment industries. It's about what you get out of it. Well, <laughs> here's what we miss out on, all right? We're not, we're, we're not the audience. He's the audience, okay? So we've come together today to worship him in spirit and in truth, right? But yet, for whatever reason, we have a very self-focused doctrine. You know, we, we as, as humans, okay? So, meology, right? I'm just making that term up. I think that's like a probably a product line called meology or something. Just disregard that. It has no connection. I'm just saying meology as in me, okay? The, the, the theology of me. And in Genesis chapter 2, we see this. Um, God gives the commandment here in, uh, in Genesis 2 and verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Notice that the commandment of God, it's not a harsh commandment. It, as a matter of fact, he hasn't even said, <laughs> he hasn't even said the negative part yet. See, his commandments are positive, okay? It's not to keep you from something. It's to preserve the good things for you. That's what his commandments are. He says, you can eat of everything in this garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He uses the word die. Now, if we'll look over at, uh, at Genesis chapter 3, you've got, um, let's see here. Verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Notice that the temptation begins with questioning the word of God, right? Uh, you know, one of the ways I believe that has been that Satan has effectively been doing this for so long is introducing multiple different translations of the Bible, right? I mean, if that's a way that you begin to question what you're reading, then there you go, you know. He begins, very first thing we see out of Satan's mouth is, hath God said. Mm -hmm. And then he says, that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You notice what he's doing. He's taking something that God framed positively and made for your benefit, and he is putting, he's putting his negative spin on it, okay. He is a, he is a master marketer, okay. Mm -hmm. he, he knows how to market something, right. He says, did God say you can't eat of every tree? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. Did God say that? No, he just said, don't eat of it, right? You see, you notice how the, the commandments of God are simple. Right. And so 
when we begin to add to the commandments of God, it just gets complicated, right? She said, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see, from the very beginning, the temptation that, that Satan lays out on the table, he doesn't come straight out and lay it out. He begins by questioning the word of God and very subtly introducing this concept. But the ultimate sell that he's making here is you want to be just like God, right? And that's, that's what we've been doing. <laughs> that's what, it, it, look, I, I know I'm not the only selfish person in, in this room, okay? We all look out for ourselves, we all, in a, in a sense, worship ourselves, okay? Right. Even from the very beginning, there was a temptation to want to be like God. All right, so this, this modern uh, meology, this modern uh, Christianity that, that puts all the focus on the sinner and what the sinner does and the things that we need to do to accept the gift of God or to, or to do some good works or whatever the case may be, that's not a new thing, okay? That's been ever since the garden, that's been a temptation, mm -hmm. is how can I be like God? How can I be that important, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So they eat of the fruit, and what happens? They don't, they don't kill over dead in the garden, okay? But did they die? Did, they, did we die in the garden? That's, that's the delineation between the modern meology and what I would consider true theology, okay, is did we die in the garden or did we not die in the garden? Well, God said we would die in the garden when we ate of that fruit. The day, that day that we ate of it, we would die. Satan said, you won't really die that day. You won't die. Um, so, you know, in my profession as a lawyer, um, <laughs> I talk to a lot of people. Okay, I talk to, I talk to, um, you know, civ in, in civil matters, and I talk to people in criminal cases. You know, I'll either talk to their attorney uh, because I'm prosecuting, or I'll talk to if they don't have an attorney and it's a misdemeanor case or something. I'll talk directly to them, and I, I've gotten real used to getting lied to. I'll just be honest with you. You know, you, you'll go and you'll and you'll say, well, you're you know, you're charged with this crime. And they'll say, no, 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 no. You know, he, you know, that he pushed me first, you know, yada, you know, they'll they'll say whatever they need to say. Now I'm not saying everybody lies, okay? But I but somebody's lying to me. I hear something from the victim, I hear something from the defendant, and and they're they're not matching. Okay, so somebody's lying to me. So, you know, there's been many times where I have literally gone into a different room and just prayed, Lord, give me discernment to discern between good and evil. That was, hey, that was Solomon's right. prayer, right? Right. right. To, to be able to discern between good and evil, right? And then I asked for the wisdom to do what's right, you know? And, and uh, this is one of those times where I, you, I don't have to pray that prayer, okay? <laughs> on, on the one hand, we've got God who cannot lie, who never will and, and, and is, is unable to lie, and then you've got the father of lies. And so one says we're going to die in the garden when we eat of it. And the other says we're not going to die. So who are you going to believe, right? We died in the garden. That is fundamental, okay? When we ate of that fruit, we died. Now, it didn't look the way we thought it would. You know, they didn't. it wasn't a poisonous apple and, or whatever fruit it was, and they just fell over dead. But we died. To the fellowship with God. There was a there was a severance in our relationship with Him. We went from being innocent to being broken in sin. Okay, and death comes by sin and all the problems we've got today. And and so I was represented, you were represented in that fall, but look, you know, I'm not a little angel here. Okay, I'm not just an innocent victim of, of my forefathers' sin. Okay, because guess what? I've sinned too. All right. And so we're all broken. We're all severed from God. But this this meology, this man thinking, this man teaching is that we didn't die in the garden. We we did as as Satan said, we weren't really going to die. We were just made sick in the garden essentially. And that 
there are some steps that we can take to make it right with God, to come back into the fold. Um, when Jesus comes to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, you see, he wanted to hear what Jesus had to say, but he didn't want anybody to know about it, okay? He comes to Jesus by night, and, and, uh, and Jesus says to him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the, the things that you're seeing today, the thing that Abraham saw on the mountain. You can't see those things unless there's something else within you, been born again, right? And what does Nicodemus do? He does exactly what we all do in our, in our me thinking. He says, how can I go back into my mother's womb? How can I do this? That sounds, that's, that's crazy. How can I do that? You know, I think the same thing with the rich young ruler comes to, to Jesus and he says, good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, I want eternal life. What do I do to get it? And of course, Jesus, uh, he, he is a master at, at leading people through questions to get to a, to a resolution, right? He says the very first thing and the key to this whole conversation is he says, why do you call me good, right? That's the key, okay? If you come to Jesus, you come to him, period, <laughs> but you come to him and you know that he is good, there's something already within you. It's life, right? He is already a child of God. He's already been born again. And so then he says, all right, so what this man is looking for is justification. He's looking for justification, what we would call by faith, okay? And, and so he says, all right, you do the works. And he says, you know, I've done all those. And then he says, oh, but we'll give to the poor. <laughs> you know, and then he goes away uh, sorrowing. And then his disciples, I guess they knew this man. They knew that he was a good man. They said, well, who then can be saved? If, if this guy can't be saved, then who can be saved? <laughs> and, of course, God says, with men, uh, it is impossible, right. but with God, all things are possible. You see, the point is not what the sinner does to be saved from hell, right? The point is that God, with God, all things are possible. Right. But he had already answered the man's question at the very beginning by saying, why do you call me good? <laughs> but even from the very beginning, and even in the days of Jesus, we have had the tendency to try to frame it as to how do, what can I do? How can I... What, can, what good thing can I do to be saved? And, and we see it today. You know, um, I, I grew up of another order. I can't tell you how many times I prayed for the Lord to forgive me of my sins and I accepted Jesus to, to, to be my Savior so that I, I would not die and go to hell. And, and then you know what happens? That next night I'm sitting in my bed alone and I'm worried about my sins, and I'm absolutely certain that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die and go to hell because I'm a, I'm a wretched sinner. And you know what I do? I accept him again as my Savior. I go through all the steps that I'm supposed to go through, and, and you know, I had no hope because, look, if, if my hopes of eternal heaven are, are hinged on me, boy, I know better than that, right? <laughs> I know myself good enough to know that if there's a way to mess it up, I can mess it up, right? And so that's what meology does. It puts all of the burden on the sinner. And even as, as uh, I believe it was Peter would say, why do you tempt God by putting the yoke upon the disciples that, that we and our fathers were not even able to bear? You are not able to keep the law. Now, Let's shift here in our, our remaining minutes from the meology to the theology, okay, to the God-centered focus, the Christ-centered focus. I pray that that might be something that might be said of me, that it might be said of us. You know, maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm whatever, but I pray that my focus is on Christ always, okay? All right, so we died in the garden. That's the fundamental, the fundamental truth. In Ephesians 2, you know this, this passage. I'm going to turn there real quick. Ephesians chapter 2. 
and it's 11.20 Central Time, so I've got about 40 minutes left. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I could quote this, but I want to read it to you, okay? Um, Ephesians 2 and verse 1. It says, And you, happy quickened, who were dead in trespasses and in sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, and the children of disobedience, among whom also we all mm -hmm. had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of, of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, all of us in our, in our natural state, we're all dead, just like he said in the garden. God said it from the very beginning. We died in the garden. We, we were dead to the fellowship with God. We were dead spiritually. And we walked just like all those other people out there in the world, just like the goats, just like whatever you want to think of, okay? But... God. You see, the whole focus of the gospel message is on Jesus Christ, your Savior. It's not on me. It's not on you. You know what? I, you know, I mean, if you really, really, really want to put yourself in the equation, you did all the sinning and he did all the saving. Okay. But the truth is, it's not about you. It's about him. All of all of history is truly his story. Right. All of all of the, the scripture is, is pointing toward Christ. Mm -hmm. You see those beautiful examples, just like in, in Abraham, and, and God will provide himself a land. You see that even in the Old Testament, God has been pointing to Jesus Christ this whole time. But God, who is rich in mercy, why does, why does he choose out people? See, we're all going to hell, right? It's not that God predestinate some to hell and some to heaven. Look, we don't need his help getting to hell. Okay, we've all got that covered. We're all going to hell, but he chooses some out. Why does he do that? We read there in the book of Romans, it's, it's, uh, it's of his mercy, right? Whom he'll have mercy, he'll have mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved. We read in the book of Psalms that he looked down through time to see all the, uh, to see his children, to see who would choose him, you know. And what did he see? He saw that none would do good, that none would choose him. And, you know, some people will say, well, that's a depressing message. No, it's not, okay. Because it tells me that when he looked at me and he saw me before the foundation of the world, he didn't see some goody two shoes that was gonna that was gonna accept him and that was gonna do right he saw a no good rotten sinner and he loved me anyway that's the beauty of the gospel okay is that he saw you in your in your state and he loved you anyway right and he said I, i'm gonna give my only begotten precious son to bleed out and to suffocate for somebody like you now that is the beauty of the gospel, right? It says, we are quickened together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. Now, um, of course, uh, I think it was Brother Harris that mentioned 1 Corinthians 2.14. I'm going to turn there to... Um, Paul says that, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God... For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Look, we're dead, right? We were dead in our in our trespasses and sins, dead in our nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think about Lazarus, okay? I know I'm jumping around a lot, but think about Lazarus in the tomb. When Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, what does Jesus do? Does he say, uh, Lazarus, will you please, will you please just call out, and give us a sign, and I'll I'll resurrect you. No, because that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> Lazarus is dead. If we're having a funeral here today, and we've got a brother or a sister laid here, and we say, "I'll give you a million dollars if you get up out of the, out of the grave, if you get up out of that casket. I'll give you a billion dollars. I'll I'll give you the national debt, whatever, tr some a trillion and counting, right?" 
It's not going to matter, okay? It is not going to affect them because why? It's pretty simple. They're dead, right? And in the exact same way, we are dead in our trespasses and in sins, okay? If you've got somebody who is crying out for Jesus, crying out for, for the brokenness of their sins, what's happened? Mm. You've got somebody who is already alive, Amen. right? You know, when, when my son was born and I heard his first cry, he wasn't asking for us to give him life, right? No. He was crying because he was alive, right? Amen. And so in the exact same way, it is, a, it is liberating to the child of God when we realize that God truly saved me from my sins. There's nothing left for me to do, right? Um, let's go to uh, Romans 11 real quick, and I'm, I'm going to be mindful of time, I promise. <clears throat> Romans 11, verse 6, this is a good um, tongue twister. If you want to have some fun, you can try to say this really fast. And Jesus, uh, uh, Paul says this, talking about this remnant according to the election of grace. He says, and if by grace, and it is no more of works... Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Okay? What he's saying here is that there's grace and then there's works. And those two have to be completely separate. Because once you begin to sprinkle in a little bit of work into grace, it's not grace anymore. Okay? Because what do you get, what do you get for your works? You get your wages. Right? You work for a living, you get paid. You get your wages. What are our wages? The wages of sin is death. That's what we got out of our works is death. But, but the free gift of God through his grace is life in Christ, right? And so when we get to heaven, we're saved by grace. When, when we are sitting there and we're singing praises to him forever, we're going to be praising him. We're not going to be praising us for accepting him, for doing the works. And, and look, I, I get it. This modern American gospel, this Christianity uh, that says God uh, died on the cross for you and he saved you, he did all the work. There's nothing you can do to be saved, but all you have to do to be saved is to, is to accept him. You know, whatever the case may be, you know, um, and, and I grew up among that, okay? Those are my friends. Those, I love those people, okay? Um, but when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any praise reserved for me. You know, because even if you said 99.99999% of the work was done by God, and that point, whatever, 0.1% was me, you know what that means? That means if I don't accept him, then I go to hell, right? It means you're the most important part of that puzzle. And that's not how it's going to be in heaven, y'all. He saved you, period. Now, so in the last moments here, um, you know, there's several other things as a part of this uh, meology versus theology debate uh, that people get real hung up on. That is the gospel, uh, the purpose of the gospel, where the gospel comes in to your salvation and your being born again and whatever the case may be. Uh, baptism is another. And then also another one that I thought of is, is um, how, what, what does your good works now how does it affect it? Okay, so let's go through each of those real quick. The gospel. What does the gospel do? There, there are, I would say, the majority of Christians today and many of my dear friends believe that the gospel must come and there must be uh, an, a, a reaction to the gospel in order to be born again, in order to have life. And that is uh, nowhere supported in Scripture. Okay, now there are... There are times in Scripture where somebody hears the gospel and they have a, as I think it was Brother Bridgman said last night, a conversion to the gospel. We are converted many times in our lives, right? But in order, in order to hear anything, we've got to have ears first, right? You've got to be alive to hear, okay? So the miracle happens when God resurrects you from the dead so that you could even hear his gospel to begin with. But what does the gospel do? The gospel brings life and immortality to light, okay? Um, if, if we're here and all the lights are off and, 
and under the lights of these buildings are on, and it's completely dark in this room, and I and and I flip the switch on. What did did me flipping the switch on create all of the furniture in here? <laughs> no, it just shed light on it. Okay, the furniture was already there. You see, the work that God did in salvation in your heart, He wrought, I believe, by His own His own voice calling you from from the grave, just as He called Lazarus from the grave. That work is within you already. The gospel just tells you about it, right? And that's why it can be such a liberation to you is when you hear what he's already done and it makes sense and it resonates. I want to hear about what he's done for me because it lifts my burdens in this life. It reminds me, hey, I, I don't have to, to carry the bondage of my, of my sins anymore. I can lay those at his feet because he's paid for them already. You know, um, if, if people say that the gospel has to be heard, um, and look, I, I want I, I want God's people to hear the gospel, okay? Mm -hmm. I want that message because I know what it's done for me. I know that the bondage that it's taken off of me. Never again have I had to have one of those long, dark nights that I used to have where I, where I, Confess my sins again and, and prayed that he, I, I accepted that gift over and over again, hoping that I wouldn't be cast into hell. I never had to have one of those nights again, right? That's the power of the gospel. Amen. But so I want God's people to hear that. But listen, there are people out there. I have a good friend, a good friend of mine who takes it very seriously. He believes that if he doesn't get the gospel and somebody dies without hearing that, that they'll die and they'll go to hell, right? And so the man can't rest, okay? He has to be evangelizing. And look, that's great, okay? I'm not saying we shouldn't evangelize. But, but here's, here's the problem. If that's what your belief is, is that if you believe that unless somebody hears the gospel, that they'll die and go to hell, well, is the blood of Christ not good enough for that person? Mm -hmm. Right. If, 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 if God is having to rely on us to save his children... We have to ask the question, was the blood of Christ not sufficient for the sins of his people? Um, also, you know, people, you know, people draw up these, these uh, exceptions to the rule. Now, in law school, they taught us, look, it, it, when you're drafting a law or you're drafting something and you've got to have so many exceptions to it to make it fit, maybe you just need to scratch it and start over, Okay. Well, so one of the exceptions to this idea that the gospel's got to get to everybody is they say, well, if you haven't heard the gospel and it's not your fault, then God makes exception and you might go to heaven anyway. Well, you know, if that's really true, then just stop preaching the gospel, right? right? And you see, you know, and that's obviously foolish, okay? What about, what about people who have mental handicaps and can't comprehend the message of the gospel, okay? Well, they say, well, you know, um, you know, I don't know what to do with those people, you know. Well, is the blood of Christ not sufficient to pay for the sins of those? Amen, he is, right. And look, they don't have to understand what he did. He did it for them anyway, right? There are plenty of things that I do for my son that he does not understand, and he doesn't have to, okay, right? Your heavenly Father does things for you all the time, and you don't have to understand it, okay? He saved you from your sins. What about what about children who get the you know the age of accountability, right? Or or that die in the womb or miscarriage or something. Um, you know, they say, well, there's an exception for them. Well, again, if you reason out something to its logical conclusion and it yields absurd results, then maybe your 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 uh, principle was off to begin with. Well, if that were the case, then then why are we so upset about abortion? You know, if, if all of those children are just going to go to heaven anyway. You see how absurd that is. You see, the, the whole beauty of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is not hindered by any, any uh, hindrance of man to Amen. save the, his children. Right? Right. It doesn't matter if you're a baby in the womb. It doesn't matter if you're a thief on the cross. It doesn't matter if you're mentally handicapped or if you're in some far region that's never heard the gospel, Jesus Christ's blood is good enough right. to save his people, right? Amen. What about baptism? You know, um, uh, 
some some people feel like you you know you have to have somebody baptized uh, um, or you'll die and go to go to hell. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, grew up Presbyterian, and so I I was a uh, uh, infant baptized, quote unquote, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then when I when I came into the primitive Baptist, I was as my parents considered it, I was rebaptized. Of course, now I consider it that I was baptized for the first time, but that's another point. Um, but listen, you know what happened when I went down into the water? My sins weren't magically washed away. You know, you know, as, as Peter said, it's not you. I, yes, we are saved in a sense in baptism, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, not not washing away your sins. But it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. What does that mean? Simply is that you get to experience identifying with your Savior and being buried and being resurrected, right? That, that's what you're doing, okay? You're identifying with your Savior, right? And then the last thing is um, where does our good works come into the picture? Meology says that... Uh, you've either got to do enough good works to be saved or you've got to do the good work of accepting it. Maybe they don't frame it as work, but the Bible says that, that belief is a work, that faith is a work. Or like, like some of our, our Calvinist brethren who I grew up amongst, um, they say, well, you've got to persevere in, in, in good works. Mm. Or, you know, they kind of, they kind of bend it around and say, that, that if you don't persevere, it's not that you lose your salvation, it's just an evidence that you never had salvation to begin with, yeah. which is some pretty crafty work, i got to say. Right. But the truth is, is that, you know, it was not about my works that Jesus saved me. When he looked down and, and he saw me, what did he see? He saw a wretched, no good sinner, and he saved me anyway. And then, as, as later what Paul would say in Ephesians, is he said... Um, uh, ordain unto good works. Let me read that. <clears throat> that we, he didn't say that we would walk in them, did he? He said that we should walk in them. Let me read that for you. <clears throat> he said, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's not going to be any boasting in heaven. It says, for we are his workmanship. It's about his works, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. You know, look, we're not all going to live a perfect, spotless life. And that's why Jesus died for you, isn't it? You know, think about, think about Samson. Did Samson persevere in godly living? He, sure enough, he did not. Okay, that was, that was what converted me, was Samson. And then David. Did David persevere in godly living? Absolutely not. What about Lot? Man, oh my word. If it wasn't in the scripture that said just Lot vexed his righteous soul daily, right. I'm so glad that verse is in there because otherwise I would have just thought he went to hell, right? You know. But we know he's in heaven, not because he did some good thing, but because Jesus' blood is sufficient to save his, his, his people from their sins, right. even right. the sins of Manasseh, right, mm -hmm. or of Mary. What about Noah? You know, Noah, this great man, he built that ark, you know, but he spent the rest of his days as a drunkard in a cave, you know. Um, you know, the whole point is why do we get bent up and, and, and bent out of shape about our works and about all these things we've got to do? The truth of the gospel and theology is that Jesus Christ saved his people from their sins, period. Hope that's encouraging to you. Amen. Amen.